the next, next break. for break anyway. Uh, I'd like to start off by saying I've been going to conferences and participating in conferences for about 40 years, and this is uh, the organization of this conference is right up there with the best. So I think uh, Steve Katinsky and Dave Nagel uh, deserve some kudos uh, for uh, uh, taking care of all the details. Uh, I'm new to this community. Some of you know me, most of you don't. Um, I'm an experimental, experimental physicist. I've been, done research for about 45 years. Uh, in uh, the area of what's usually called OAMP, optical uh, atomic molecular uh, plasma physics. Uh, about 15 years of that has been done in the academic environment at various universities, but the last 30 years has been in the research labs of the Aerospace Corporation. The Aerospace Corporation is a nonprofit corporation uh, incorporated uh, in California, and its headquarters are located in the Los Angeles area. It's often described as a uh, think tank for all areas of space technology. Our customers are all the uh, domestic space agencies and all the prime contractors, but we also have quite a few international customers. In order, in order to support those customers, uh, we have about 10% of the corporation uh, resources are in a research lab, and that's where I spent my time. The data I'm going to present today, I will say, is, is, of, uh, is a reproduction data uh, in, in a skeptical environment uh, and is, uh, was, was planned uh, about a half a dozen years ago, so to a certain extent it has uh, historical, uh, it's more historical than current. Uh, <clears throat> all the data I'm going to present it is in, is, in, is presented in detail in a 30-page report that's listed on the bottom of the slide. You can get this report by emailing the library at the Aerospace Corporation and referencing that number, or you can email me at that email and I will send you a copy. So I'm not going to go dwell on details. The report is quite readable because most of the details are in nine appendices, so you can go through it pretty quickly. Let's see if this thing works. Good. So this is basically the outline I'm going to go through. I'll start a few minutes on motivation in the environment that I'm in. Uh, then we're going to look at the manifestation that I used, which I call the Arata Hearn manifestation. And then we'll talk about the aerospace uh, 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 experiment that I did. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, let's see if I can do this right here. Okay. So here's the interest in my community. Uh, I've spent about 20 years developing uh, technology of electric propulsion. And so when I became aware of the work that had been done back then, a half a dozen years ago, about 20 years' work, I was actually quite surprised. And I thought it had a tremendous opportunity to revolutionize the space technology business. And uh, I thought the easiest way that this could happen was using uh, a gas phase manifestation, which is easier to use on orbit. And it would be a very easy drop-in replacement for RTDs, uh, uh, RTGs, which are radioisotope thermal generators, uh, especially because NASA Glenn had spent about 20 years uh, developing a uh, high-efficiency thermal uh, Stirling engine for that, which is purported to have about a 20-year on-orbit lifetime. So it looked like a really easy drop-in, and if the technology could be ready, I could uh, possibly convince the powers to be at management, which was a skeptical environment, that it was worth uh, investing some money in. Um, so uh, that's my motiva motivation. Electric propulsion has become very popular, especially in geosync satellites of recent, because, uh, in fact, most geosync satellites today are, are, uh, are uh, uh, launched with electric propulsion, and, uh, and it's primarily because the power of the buses has gone up. It's not unusual to have 20 kilowatt power buses on these that would run 5 kilowatt plasma thrusters, uh, two of them uh, simultaneously. If the power density, if we could get 100 kilowatts on power without huge solar panels, it would just revolutionize uh, the electric propulsion world and the satellite uh, 
uh, technology. And that was my interest and my corporation's interest. Now the environment I'm working in is uh, most of all our research in the research labs is externally funded uh, and we have a limited internal R&D budget. Uh, it's typically something like a half manpower for a couple of years. So in choosing an experiment uh, in a skeptical environment, I basically had one shot at it. Uh, it had to be pretty simple. And so I built in three criteria that I wanted for this, that it had to basically be simple to implementate, high pro probability of success, that it had to be uh, reproducible by an independent person at least once. And uh, to be simple, I wanted something simple triggering, no lasers and plasmas. Uh, uh, thermal triggering would be the best way to do it. Um, so what I chose was at the time, this was conceived, which is about six years ago, the only data I saw out there that met this was the uh, Arata method that was uh, developed in Japan and has been carried forward uh, uh, elegantly and beautifully by the Technova uh, presentations that you saw yesterday. And it was duplicated in 2003, uh, the Brian Ahern uh, Ypres report. And uh, Brian was uh, very uh, helpful in me uh, preparing the material for this. Uh, so uh, that is the, it was the simplest experimental implementation and it had, I believe, a high probability of success so I could see it first time. Sample preparation was very similar to what you saw discussed yesterday in the Tec Technova presentations. Uh, the base material was a uh, metal ribbon prepared by Ames Research Labs. It was basically two-thirds zirconium, one-third uh, nickel, and about 3% uh, uh, palladium. Uh, I processed that locally, heated it at 440C for 28 hours to oxidize it. I then ground it up with a mix master uh, to particle sizes of three to five microns. And then, uh, so I, that was my base material, my active material. Then I did something that was different from what was done in the two previous implementations of this because there was so much uh, uh, talk in the literature about the effects of magnetic field on this process. I decided <coughs> to mix in some magnetic particles. So I looked at rare earth magnets that had high magnetic fields. I chose samarium cobalt magnets for reasons you can read about in the uh, in the report. By the way, I cannot present anything today that's not in the report. The good news is the report has all the detail I know, so I can't really do it. But all the, all the, uh, the uh, uh, Im uh, images that I have to report or, in, or have to use today are on the, in that report. So uh, you can see various uh, stages of, uh, of, uh, of the processing the material in this slide. So uh, there were two experiments done. The first one I called a practice learning experiment. Uh, experiment. Also, both experiments used two cells. Uh, one was a control cell and one was the active cell. Each cell was a 10 centimeter stainless steel uh, vessel that was held uh, with a long stainless steel rod that tried to be as thermally isolated as possible. It was encased in a vacuum. I'll show you in a minute. But the first practice run uh, in both cells, I put 10 grams of the active material, but in the second cell, I added 10 grams of the magnetic uh, samarium cobalt magnet materials to it. And both cells were loaded with deuterium gas in this. Um, the results of this are not in the main body of the part, they're in, uh, in the report, they're in the, in the first appendix. I'm not going to go into that at all. I don't feel like I can rigorously defend it because of a lot of uh, issues that I corrected in the, in the second data run. Uh, but the important thing is that I saw excess heat in both of them, but I saw significantly more excess heat with the, with the cell with the particles in it. So in the main run, I included magnetic particles in it, which is the main difference between the Arata and the Ahern uh, experiments. This shows you the architecture. The cell was supported by a, th a thin stainless steel 
tube. It was inside a, a vacuum jacket to isolate it from the environment. Uh, the, uh, as I said, it, the, the cell was wound with uh, heating wire, nichrome wire in this case. In, this ca in the main experiment, the two cells had exactly the same material in it. Uh, and once in the test cell was, was uh, pressurized with hydrogen and the, and the a reference cell was pressurized with nitrogen. Uh, the power in, the pressure, and the temperature were recorded, and the power was inferred from calibration curves, which I'll talk about uh, in a second. All measurements were uh, computer controlled 24 7, measurements were ta taken every 30 seconds. This shows you a picture of the apparatus before submitted in, uh, put, before put in the vacuum jacket. You can see on the top left uh, the, the thermocouples, which were type K thermocouples with uh, refractory coatings that were put in the cells, and then they were loaded with the materials. Uh, we had some really fancy equipment in aerospace where we could do x-ray tomography of the cells before, uh, after they were loaded. I did this in order to assure that the cells were uniform and the thermocouples were away from the walls and separated and, in, and surrounded by materials, which you can see in the bottom two images. There's a lot more images in the, uh, in the report. This is, a, this is basically a breakdown of the cell contents. It's in the, in the report. You can look at it. But basically, there were 20 grams of active material in each cell and about 6 grams of the samarium cobalt magnets. Uh, this, this chart actually shows the, uh, the oxygen that was absorbed during the oxygen, oxygenation uh, process, the oxidation process. This shows the experimental setup. The cells were connected to a vacuum system which had a, a, an oil-free turbo pump that could be used to evacuate it. It had both uh, pressure dance transducers and uh, board-on gauges that I could read out the pressure in either cell. They could be pressurized with either hydrogen or nitrogen through the gas manifold. Uh, it was all controlled by one uh, computer. All the instrumentations were on un uninterruptible power, su power supplies because the tests ran for more than two months and we had uh, numerous power interruptions which couldn't be allowed during the measurement. Okay, here is the experimental timeline that we used. Um, Basically, the, the period of the, of the whole experiment was 67 days. It included a, a, a cell bake-out at temperatures between 150 and 350 degrees under vacuum to basically remove water. Then there was a six-day calibration period. Calibration was done under two gas conditions. One was vacuum, evacuated, and the other one was one bar of nitrogen in both cells. Um, and that period uh, went, that went between uh, up to 300 degrees C. Um, there was a gas loading period which lasted two days. There was the heating triggering period which lasted four days. And then there was a 42-day period which I ran it at constant temperature and power to measure the excess, uh, any excess power if there was any. And then there was a 13-day step-down period. This shows the calibration curves. Uh, there are four. There should be eight curves there, one for each uh, uh, thermocouple in, four, in in two cells with four different uh, uh, two different pressures. But the calibration curves for the two different thermocouples in the same cell lay right on top of each other. So effectively, there are just four different calibration curves. The sensitivity of the device is about you get about a twelve and a half degree change for every watt of uh, power change. So this is, I'll show you just a couple of data slides here. Uh, there are many data slides in the report. This uh, data slide is a 50 hour period showing the pressurization. The top graph is this cell one that was hydrogen pressurized. The bottom cell is the nitrogen pressurization. The ni both were pressurized to about four and a half bar absolute. Uh, there was a slight absorption of, by the material of nitrogen, which basically stopped, which you'll see in the next slide, which is a 1,000-hour period. 
The interesting, uh, so what you see here is both the temperature and the, and, um, the pressure curves on here. Uh, the interesting one is the top curve. When the hydrogen is first loaded in, this is light hydrogen, there is the exothermic uh, H2 absorption, which is a chemical reaction. It jumped from room temperature, 23 degrees, to 48 degrees, a difference of 25 degrees C. If you integrate the energy underneath that uh, pipe curve, it's about a kilojoule. It's 1,120 joules of energy. Uh, it, comes right, it comes right back down. If you look at the black curves, which is, are the pressure curves, the hydrogen starts off at about four and a half bars. It drops to a couple of bars. I repressurize it. It drops again. I repressurize it a third time to four bars. It drops again. And then after another 24 hours, uh, 24 hours of dropping, I normalize the pressure in both cells to approximately one bar before I go to the next stage. Now, I'm going to apologize for the next slide because it's a bit busy. It's designed for the uh, report, which has a lot of verbiage explaining all, the, all the, uh, the detail on it. But basically, on each of the curves, there'll be, uh, each of the graphs, there'll be uh, five curves. Uh, and the two important ones are the top ones, the, the light red and the uh, light green, which represent the excess power. So what you're looking here at is at a, uh, a thousand hours of data, basically 42 uh, days of data. The top curve that you see is the temperature divided by 200 on this scale. The temperature in that range is between about 293 to 295 degrees centigrade, so just under 300 degrees centigrade, held constant. The power is constant over this period. The third uh, curves down are the excess uh, power curves. Uh, there are two of them there. There's a red and a green. I'll explain that in a second. Uh, that curve height represents an excess power of about one watt for an input power of about 12 watts or about seven and a half percent excess power. The error on that one watt is about uh, five percent, plus or minus five percent. The top curve, as I said, is the nitro is the cell one with the, uh, the hydrogen in it. The bottom sets of curves are the, are the second cell with, an, with the uh, nitrogen in it. I think I, the top cell is the hydrogen. And you can see the red curve at the bottom hugs the zero line, which is the excess uh, power that's measured uh, in the, the control cell. That number is a little bit above uh, the zero line by about 50 milliwatts, 0.05 watts. Uh, to be very conservative in estimating the excess power of the top cell, I subtracted that 0.05 watts from it, which is the green curve that you see at the top. So this is the result slide. And what I did is, during a 950-hour period, a 40-day integration period, I integrated all the power to get the total energy. For the nitrogen cell, uh, the integrated power gave me about a tenth of a megajoule. Uh, for the hydrogen cell, I integrated that power and subtracted that tenth of a megajoule to get a total power of three and a half megajoules. Uh, estimated error is plus or minus six percent on that. Uh, if I normalize that to the mass to get the specific energy, if I normalize to the total mass, the total 20 grams, including the zirconium oxide, I get a specific energy of 130, 173 megajoules per kilogram. If I normalize it just to what is believed the active material, which is the nickel uh, and the palladium, I get a, a specific energy density of 635 megajoules per kilogram. For reference, the highest hydrocarbon fuel listed is methane is, a, is about one-tenth of that, 55 megajoules per kilogram. The highest record uh, chemical energy I could find was highly compressed uh, hydrogen. I think it was up, you know, 120 uh, bar or something. Came out to 142 megajoules per chemical. Uh, per kilogram. 
That was for the 40-day integration period. It followed a 13-day power down period. I'm not going to say much about that now because there's not time. It's all in the report. The, uh, the excess power for the H2 cell went down as the power went down. It, it looked uh, uh, like a credible thing. So the takeaway from the slide is that the excess energy, to my eye, looks like it can't be of chemical origin. And so I, assume, I considered that I had basically verified the results of Arata and uh, of Ahern that was previously uh, done. So uh, I go through the strengths and the, uh, the weaknesses of this. So let me just you know, um, speak a minute too for the weaknesses. Um, I think the main weakness is uh, that I did use thermometry instead of calorimetry. Calorimetry uh, is the right way to do it. Uh, since I've left, uh, retired from aerospace about three years ago, I have now built a lab and developed the technology to do it right using uh, calorimetry. Not as good as the Technova guys. These guys are great, doing great work, and I love it. Um, the other big uh, problem I, I have with this, or, or weakness, would be the fact that the, te the thermocouples are embedded in the material. And even though I coated the material to try to keep inter any action, interaction out with it, uh, this work was vetted with, to a lot of people. I have about three minutes, I think. Um, vetted by a lot of people. Probably the most interesting one is, in order to get some follow-on funding, I presented this material to the Jason group, who consisted of Richard Garwin and uh, William Happer of Princeton University. And they came out with the most interesting criticism of it that I hadn't considered. And Will Happer told me that, uh, that uh, type K thermocouples in reducing atmospheres and hydrogen atmospheres actually gave erroneous measurements, which I didn't know about. And I, I said, well, they're, they're coated with uh, a refractory. And he said, well, it could penetrate this refractory. In fact, Garwin suggested an experiment I could do to see if that was a problem. However, on investigation of this uh, process, it's actually called green rot, I believe, in the literature. It only occurs above six or 700 degrees C, something you should consider if you're using a type K thermocouple in a reducing atmosphere. But when it does happen, it actually lowers the uh, indicated temperature, which would make the, my measurements even more conservative uh, if they were true. So, so I'm going to say uh, just one word on the believability of the results. Uh, as I said, these were presented to my management, which is uh, a skeptical environment. Uh, were they believed? I think the people who were really not uh, inundated and brought up at my level of, of seeing the whole Pounds Fleshman Imbroglio in the late 80s um, were actually accepted the results. If they were, it, it, it was an amazing situation. They wouldn't even, you know, would just say, I don't believe it, or they wouldn't even look at the results. I, I you know, I stayed away from social sciences just so I, you know, because in, in physics you have a real arbiter. You just go to the lab, but if people don't accept the lab results, I don't know what you do. So it made me try to study psychology a little bit. And I came up with two very well noted uh, studies in psychology. And one's called confirmation bias, which leads to cog cognitive dissonance. And the two working together just short circuit critical thinking. <laughs> and uh, we all have primate brains, and we're all susceptible to this. And we all have to be careful about it. So be aware of it. Uh, I think Tom Darden's uh, opening talk uh, was very insightful along these ways. And I think we should all be careful that we don't fall to that. And at that, I'll, uh, I'll stop. And if you have any particular questions, uh, you can. OK, what, one quick question. And then a quick question yeah. on the magnetic uh, additions that you put into the cell. Was that the one you discussed here, or was that yeah. a different test? That was what was discussed here. The med OK. The, yes. A uh, quick question. Uh, nitrogen versus hydrogen, they have different uh, thermal conductivities, different uh, 
convective yeah. heat transfer, what did you, how yeah. did you compensate? Good, good question. Well, it turns out that I used the calibration curves for vacuum for the, uh, I didn't have a time to say it, but if you looked at the pressure curves for the measurements, the pressure in the night in the hydrogen test cell went to zero, so it was basically vacuum. It was all absorbed, it was less than a 20th of an atmosphere. However, the nitrogen stayed at the calibration uh, pressure, and so that curve was used for that cell, and the vacuum curve was used for the other cell. Okay, I think uh, there's another question, but I suggest let's do that with a cup of coffee in our hands outside. I'll be around all uh, week. Dave, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all of our presenters.